Welcome to the lush and verdant, verdant vegetation where we attempted to show you a bird but it flew away and there is just a certain inevitability to that when starting a live safari. I hope you're all super excited. This is Safari Live. Good afternoon to all of you and welcome on our sunset safari live from one of the most incredibly rich and diverse wildlife areas in the world. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Martin is on camera with me and we're coming to you live from a place called Juma Private Game Reserve which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And just forgive me for one second because I'm concentrating on trying to find an elephant that I promise you was here. I'm going to find them. But just quickly some housekeeping to get out of the way. A very warm welcome to the two schools joining us. I hope you guys are super excited to see some animals this afternoon. So welcome to Hampton Oaks and Liberty Middle School. It's wonderful to have you with us and I hope you're all going to be sending through lots of interesting and exciting questions. For all of our other viewers, please don't stop sending through your questions. Please send them through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We will still be answering them as soon as we are done chatting to the kids. Now, uh, since my elephants have completely vanished, I think it's time to send you over to somebody who's had slightly more luck. A few seconds. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and <laughs> we have another elephant. And this one is at the waterhole at the moment. A beautiful male. And he looks like he was just splashing himself, trying to cool down. It is very, very warm this afternoon, as Jamie has said. My name is Byron, and on camera with me this afternoon is Senzo. So it is great to have all of you with us. And don't forget to send us your questions. I know Jamie would have told told you already and look at this elephant splashing himself with the water it's cooling down oh, this is wonderful uh, Derek now elephants in Africa can live up to about the age of about 50 or 60 years old so that's um, that's that's a really old age for these big animals and Wow, look at that. Doesn't that look like fun? Just splashing himself with the water. Oh, cooling down. I must admit, I'm feeling a little bit jealous watching this elephant splash himself with that water. So Derek, yeah, as I said, about 50 to 60 years old. That's the average age of an elephant in Africa. Oh, and now this male is really enjoying bit of mud and the water he's just resting he's actually you see how he's leaning back on his foot ah oh, they just moved now now Elvin as you can see one of the ways the elephants cool themselves off is by splashing water on themselves just like this ma this male is doing and then also what they do they've got those beautiful big ears so what happens is they'll flap their ears and the reason for that is there are a lot of veins that run through the ears and there's a lot of blood that goes through those ears so by flapping them they actually cool the blood down and that takes about seven or eight minutes to circulate through the body so what happens then is that helps cool the body down not by much but by a little bit but splashing the water like this will help a lot there the male goes he's had enough of the water and the mud and he's moving off probably going to start feeding again we know the elephants need a lot of food to keep those big bodies moving and going so they they're constantly feeding 
and there's a lot of lovely grass around at the moment for them. The bush is very, very green. So all this food is great for these animals, especially the big elephant. Uh, now Alexis, the tusks actually do not grow back if they lose them or if they break. And as that elephant moves off slowly, there he goes just up the road. So Alexis, they don't grow back unfortunately. If they break their tusks, they don't grow back at all. And elephant tusks will grow throughout their lifetime. But, um, but if they do break off even half a tusk, no, they don't grow any further. Their nerves and that, that run through the tusk itself. And once those nerves have been severed, they don't grow again, unfortunately. But, um, but it's, it's not always elephant to lose their tusks. It, it does happen occasionally, especially with big males. If they're fighting, you, that's usually when the tusks break or they might lose a tusk is if they are fighting with one another. Um, but that's usually in the big males. Sometimes they might break it on a tree if they're trying to break the branches, but that's quite unlikely. Um, anyway, so generally, their tusks grow throughout their lifetime unless they break. And then they um, and then they won't grow back anymore. I'm going to carry on. I'm heading to an area known as Cheetah Plains to go and see what we can find down there. Now Jamie and I are not the only ones out here. Our friend Brent is walking in the bush at the moment. Let's go say hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I've got Craig on camera and we are tracking a female leopard. She was seen late this morning in this area, but we're having to play dodge the elephant at the moment. I can hear a big herd of elephants just off to the east of me, and we're hoping we're gonna be able to find this female leopard. I don't think she's moved too far. It's been quite hot today. So a big welcome to Liberty Middle School. I hope you're ready for an exciting safari. Okay, so we're just checking very carefully here. We've got this little dry riverbed behind us. And that's an area where leopards like to spend quite a lot of time. So we're just double checking the tracks in this area. And we might get a view of some of those elephants as well. And the elephants were moving east away from us. But you've always got to have your ears working hard when you're in the bush. Because that's what keeps you safe. Now, <laughs> We've got a very relaxed Inyala, which is not a good sign when you're tracking a leopard because he's not going to be that relaxed if there was a leopard close by. So it's a young male Inyala, which is an antelope. Now, it's really good for us to know that he's here because he's going to be an alarm system for us. So if that leopard is close to this area, if he sees her, he's going to go, oh. and basically in Inyala language, what he's saying is, leopard! Leopard, be careful! Now, he's not paying any attention to us. He's looking deeper into the into the bush there. Now, I'm just going to watch him for a little bit. Ah, oh, there's a squirrel. That's what he spotted. He spotted a squirrel. I just saw a squirrel jump past. So, the last tracks we had for this little leopard were heading in this direction. Now, with all these elephants around, they might have chased her. So. We're going to keep checking, and while we do that, I've just been chatting about elephants. It seems like Byron's found one. So this is actually the same one, Brent, but he's hanging around, and I know a lot of you might still have some elephant questions, so I'd like to stay with him a little bit longer while he's still here. Ah, now hang on a second. Now, Ashley Marie, I'm going to get to your question now. But there's another elephant up ahead. Look, there's another male. Look at that. Let me just move a little bit closer. We can see both of them. Ah, that's wonderful. Now, Ashley Marie, you wanted to know what the difference between the African elephant and the Asian elephant is, or the Indian elephant. Um, <laughs> so. The main difference, Ashley Marie, is if you just had to look at them from a distance, the main difference immediately is the ears. The African elephant have much bigger ears compared to the Indian elephant. Um, so, and also the Indian elephant is smaller than the African elephant. So the African elephant, bigger ears, it's a bigger animal. It lives longer than the Asian elephant and does live longer. 
And um, so those are the three three big differences immediately. The shape of the head is also very different. So Ashley Marie, I hope that answers your question. Those four things immediately you can tell the difference between an Asian elephant and an African elephant. But the ears are a dead giveaway. The African elephant have these huge ears which they say, and if you look at them, they are almost in the shape of Africa. These very big ears and the shape is in the shape of Africa. Maybe, maybe your teachers can show you a map of Africa and you can have a look at what I mean, that beautiful African shape and they can show you what I mean by the ears of the African elephant almost having that shape. And you can see what I was talking about earlier, about these animals cooling themselves down. You see the ears flapping. Watch this elephant, every now and then they flap their ears. You see that? There we go. And that also helps cool them down, as I explained. Ah, Daryl, now elephant can actually run very, very fast. Um, uh, surprisingly fast. Now I'm trying to think of the miles if I have to um, have to work it out quickly. An elephant can run about 35 kilometers an hour. Um, probably a top speed, 35 kilometers an hour. Um, so that would be the equivalent of maybe about 20 miles, 22 miles an hour. So somewhere, somewhere around there, I th think. Yeah, about about that. So what you can maybe do is when you go home today, ask your parents just to drive at about 20 miles an hour or so, and see how fast that is uh, for a big elephant to move. They really are enjoying that green grass at the moment. Just as I said earlier, they move out and away from the water holes to go and feed during the day. And elephant will feed throughout the day. They need a lot of food to keep those big bodies moving. And with the grass at the moment, it's a great time to be an elephant. There's food everywhere. They'll feed on the leaves of the trees, the grass. Everywhere they look, there's potential food for them. Alright, well, Jamie's still out on drive. Let's go and have a look if she's managed to find anything yet this afternoon. I haven't managed to find everything yet, but I have complete faith in my approach to this afternoon's drive. On a very hot day, Byron's already said there's plenty of food around for the animals, but on a very hot day like today, and it's 31 degrees centigrade, which is 89 in Fahrenheit, what do you think would be the best approach to trying to find an animal? Well, my idea is to go and check all of these water holes that are around the reserve to see whether anything has come to have a drink. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem as though there's any animals around this particular water hole. They're all hiding away. And in the heat of the day, probably somewhere deep in the shade. If they've not come for a swim or for a drink, then they're going to be hiding away and sleeping in the shade. So that's what we're going to be looking for. So far, no buffalo wallowing in the mud. But over there, we have something very interesting right in the middle of your screen. And just have a look back there. Now that is somebody's home at the back. Those little dangling things that you can just see, there they are. Those little dangling nests. Now those, those nests actually belong to a special type of bird known as a weaver bird. And in this case, they look like they belong to the weavers known as southern masked weavers. Now just look at that. That was made by a bird. How incredible is that? That the bird is able to weave the grass around, dangle it from the top part of the branches, and create this perfect safe place to lay their eggs. 
And here's the special thing about weaver's nests. It's made by the male weaver bird. So the male actually is the one in charge of making the nest and that's how he woos a female or how he gets a female to be his mate. By building the best possible nest that he can. By weaving the grass around itself and tying it basically in knots. And if the female doesn't like it, if, he, if she comes up to him and she doesn't like the nest that he's built, do you know what she does? She actually tears it apart. All his hard work, his days and days of hard work, she just tears it up and he has to start once again. It's a very clever strategy that they have because if you look closely, see how the nest are dangling from a thorn tree. And not only that, they're dangling above the water. And what do you think? Why do you think they build them that way? Well, if you think about it, it makes it very difficult for predators to actually get into the nest and either steal the eggs of the bird or potentially grab the chicks. So it's a very clever approach because even a snake might struggle to get right onto the end of those delicate branches. And any kind of bird that might want to steal the eggs would also struggle to get in there. So it's a very, very clever technique that the weavers adopt. Hmm. Anil, you want to know if I can give my best bird call? Well, Arneel, I'm actually quite famous for doing the worst animal impressions in the world, and that extends to bird calls, but I, for you, I shall try. Probably my best one is a little bird known as a pearl-spotted owl. Let me just see if my bird book's in here. It is, because there's no point in me giving you a bird call if I can't show you what the bird looks like, is there? Now, a pearl-spotted owlet is one of my favorite calls because they make a sound like this. Now, let's see. Now that you put me under pressure, Brilliant. <laughs> so that is a pearl spotted owlet and it's one of my favorite calls. Hold on one second. I will find a picture for you so that you know what it looks like because otherwise it doesn't make much sense, does it? That is a pearl spotted owlet. This little one over here. So I'm going to go back and practice my different bird calls so that next time you ask me I'll have a vast array of different bird calls. Oh, I can do a scop cell too. Okay, but I was going to say perhaps we should ask Brent to do a bird call, but he can't because at the moment he has to be very, very quiet. Well, we do have to be quite quiet. We're about 50 feet away from a herd of elephants on foot. And they're slowly moving through the bush feeding. That's why you've got to be so careful when you walk. You've really got to use all your senses, your eyes, your ears, your smell, to make sure you don't stumble upon one of these big, great, grey beasts. Because even though they are so big, they can be very, very quiet. And they can sneak through the bush without you even knowing they're there. So this is a young bull right on the peripheries. The females and the smaller ones are further away from us. Now the wind suddenly just changed a little bit. The wind was in our favor. You can probably hear us as well. Elephants have got really great hearing. But they're not moving towards us. I'm just keeping a close eye on them. They're going to keep moving off. And uh, he's going to come back into shot now. Uh, Eduardo is wondering, how do elephants defend themselves? Well, quite simply, Eduardo, by being the biggest, they can squash you, they can stab you, they can kick you, they can pull you in half with their trunk. So they've got lots of different ways of defending themselves. And just their, their massive size is the biggest defense they have. Now, we're going to let these ellies move through. They're going to move into some quite thick bush shortly. And uh, we're going to keep looking for this female leopard. And we're going to slowly make our way from here back down towards the little dry river system. And it is quite thick here, so we're not going to keep on those elephants. Hello, Alexis. Alexis is wondering, do any of the cats ever attack elephants? Only lions and only in very special circumstances, especially in places like northern Botswana. 
Okay, let's just double check where they've gone. And we've just got to make sure that there's none straggling behind. So we just stop a little bit and we listen. So I can hear some over there. And I can hear some basically all oh, 180 degrees in front of us. Which means our way to get out of here is we're going to go down here and back down towards the river. Hi Yasmin. Uh, Yasmin would, wants to know how old was I when I knew I wanted to be a guide. Well Yasmin, I'm very very lucky. I've sort of always known. I grew up in the bush in safari lodges. So I've been doing, or going on safaris and walks and game drives uh, since I was about three or four years old. My, one of my first memories is actually of elephants. Watch out Craig, that will hurt a lot. There's lots of thorns there. So, as I said, very lucky. I've been able to, before the, t before the time I was 14, I'd been to Botswana, Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, all over South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and all on safari. So I was very, very lucky. Ah, oh, just making sure the elephants aren't following us. Sometimes they do that. They get curious, so they'll wander towards the sound. Oh, now Jamie says I'm quite good at being, doing bird calls. I think, I think I'm probably not the best, but I'll give it a try. Oh, I've got so many favorite bird calls, but I think probably my most favorite hmm, is a Verose eagle owl, or a giant eagle owl. And they sort of go... But anyway, there we go. Let's see what other bird calls Jamie's got for you. Oh, I hear that Brent's been doing the Verose Eagle Owl call and actually one of my favorite calls is very very similar to a Verose Eagle Owl and it's made by a bird that looks kind of, no, doesn't look like a turkey, it's about the size of a turkey and it's got a bright red face and black feathers and it's called a Uh, the ground hornbill sounds a little bit like this. Which is kind of the sound that the car is making now for some reason as it edges slowly but surely down the road. So while I find you a picture of a ground hornbill, since everything else is hiding away, I hear that Jasmine wants to know how old Brent was when he wanted to be a safari guide, or knew he wanted to be a safari guide. I was just over about two years old when apparently I said to my mom, I want to be a vet. And that was when I first knew that I wanted to work with animals. And then I was about eight when I realized that I absolutely had to work in the bush, which is where we are now. Somewhere out where wild animals are completely wild. There you go. That is the southern ground hornbill. Gook, 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 gook. It's a beautiful sound. Ah, very good question, Alvin. And I wish I had a picture to show you, but I'll have to just find you a nest instead. Alvin would like to know, well, how did the weavers get into the nest itself? If I said it's so difficult to get in. So what they do is the way that they build it, and I'd love to build one quickly for you, but I don't think I'd be able to. But the way that they do it is they create that ball, they weave that ball, and then at the bottom there's actually an entrance hole. And what they do is they fly down and they even perch upside down when they're building it. They swoop down and then they fly straight up into the entrance hole. And because they know exactly where it is, they don't have to cling on to the different branches or the different parts of the nest. They can just swoop in and pop into the nest itself. So that's the way that the southern masked weavers get into their nest hole. Now some birds even make fake entrance holes so they'll have a real one and then they'll have a one that looks like it's a 
perfectly good entrance hole and that tricks some of the predators that might try to eat their chicks or their eggs it actually tricks them into thinking that that's the entrance and they end up in a dead end in that particular nest and they can't find their way into the real entrance holes and different birds have lots of different nest sites and I can actually see a potential one just off to the left of me let me see whether or not Martin's going to be able to show you if you zoom into the tree that is behind there. Oh, it's a little bit tricky. I don't think Martin can actually show you. I think it's hidden behind the branches of the tree. Well, we are still looking for this little leopard. We haven't gone too far. So it is quite hot. It's about 80 odd Fahrenheit. There's some nice big trees in this area around the edge of the river. So I was hoping that little leopard might be up in the tree. She might be in the base of one of these thickets we're heading towards here. Now we've got to be so careful because of elephants. So we're just going to go very slowly. So as you walk through the bush like this, it's always good every now and then you just stop and you listen and you just scan through the bush you're looking for tiny little movements and that's how sometimes you find a leopard it could just be the flick of an ear or a flick of a tail because a leopard relies on camouflage so sometimes you can walk within four feet of them and they just hide and you don't even see them and it's hot and if I was a leopard I think this little thicker chair would be quite good I don't think the elephants went into it now, the elephants could have chased her. Elephants don't like cats, or hyenas, or, or wild dogs. They chase them always. So if the elephants happen to smell her, they might chase her. Hi, Geo. Geo is wondering, how do elephants form herds? Well, Geo, they are maternal herds. So all the related females will normally stay together and the bulls will leave the herd when they get to about 15 or 16 years old. See, doesn't this look nice? If I was a little leopard, this looks like a nice shady spot to have a snooze. I just want to look carefully in here. And with that golden coat with their black spots, it breaks up the, eyeli uh, their, their, the outline of their body and they can disappear into something like this. There we go, just helping Craig through here. Okay. So we're right on the edge of the riverbed now. And we're just having a careful look. There's lots of good spots for leopards to hide here. And Lissa is wondering, how do we navigate? Well, this, uh, fortunately, we, we've all got a pretty good sense of direction. We know this area quite well. But if we were walking in an area that I'd never been before, I would look at the sun, most importantly. Well, let's get to the top of this little hill. So, we would use the sun. Oh, you okay, Craig? Yeah. So, the sun always sets in the west and rises in the east. So I know the sun's going down now, it's the afternoon. So there's east, there's west. And depending on where you are, certain tree species will grow in the shady side of a valley. So you can have a look. So you know that's going to have morning sun where we were just now. So for most of the day, that little thicket is going to be really shady and really cool. Termite mounds will face prevailing winds. Uh, this is one of the best navigation tools in an area you don't know rivers. They don't have to have water in them. A dry riverbed like this and it will often cut through an area so you'll know whether you are the side of it and you can work your way back like that. But no little leopard. Let's just have a look. There's some big trees over there. So I always want to check into the big trees in case a leopard's sleeping in there. Mr. Bowers would like to know what 
sort of decisions do you make or what do you listen for when you make a decision on a walk? Uh, well, you always try to keep wind in mind. At the moment the wind is going from north to south, if I use my foot like this, and you can see the dust. So oh, maybe southwest the wind is blowing at the moment. Uh, well, the main thing we listen for is buffalo and elephant, because those are the two that are really potentially dangerous for us, far more than the big cats and things like that. So, when you're approaching a waterhole, you're listening for splashes in the mud. That could either be buffalo or elephant. Branches breaking, uh, and well, in buffalo's case, sometimes they, they let out a low grunt. Uh, those type of things that sort of really decide where you're going. And of course, one of the most important things is what you're looking for. So we're looking for leopards. So we're sticking around the little riverbeds. We're going in and out of the little thickets, and we're hoping that this little female leopard hasn't moved too far. So she's really hungry, which makes her a little bit more difficult to find because she. Might might have moved during the heat of the day. Alvin is wondering, do we ever call for the animals while tracking them? Alvin, we don't. But we are listening for other signs that will call us to an area. So an antelope, if it sees a leopard, certain antelope will bark, certain antelope will, will, will snort, and Impala will snort, Inyala will bark, uh, monkeys will chatter, and basically they're all warning all the other animals that there is a, a potential apex predator in the area. Uh, even listening to the tiniest little birds, cesticulars and things like that can often help you find a big cat. Now I was really hoping she might be hiding around here, but this is where that herd of elephants moved through. They came down the river and went up there and that's where we saw them. Well, Ashley's wondering, what do I use my stick for? Well, Ashley, it's mostly for beating my cameraman when he doesn't listen to me. So when Craig doesn't listen, I just tap him on the head. No, I'm joking. I use it for pointing. It can be quite useful, specifically with elephants and stuff. If an elephant comes up to me, I can make myself big. Um, I use it for digging. Uh, and just a nice uh, sense of comfort. I have thrown it at a buffalo before as well. Uh, and sometimes when you get into a potentially dangerous situation, something like a stick, just throwing it into the bush uh, can create a bit of doubt, gets a, a noise that they're not expecting, or even just hitting them gets a, something that's not expecting. Now, let's go see what Byron has managed to find down in the far east. So I haven't found anything just yet, Brent. I'm looking though. Um, we are in search of anything really, so let's see what we can find. I am on Cheetah Plains And I'm going to be heading to those beautiful clearings that they have got in this area very soon But let's see what else we can find in the meantime now. There is a water hole that will be coming up soon So we'll have a look around there especially on a warm day like today We will hopefully have animals going down to drink just like we saw that elephant drinking earlier. So maybe we're lucky. And lots of beautiful butterflies flying around at the moment. You might see them every now and then. Just crossing in front of the screen, in front of the vehicle. Plenty of different butterflies, beautiful colors, yellow and orange, black and white. Some wonderful, wonderful colors. Uh, now, speaking of animals going down to water, Jamie's found an animal that lives in the water. Not just down to the water, under the water, as it just so happens. I mean, right up until just two seconds before you came across here, we were watching a hippopotamus. But now the hippopotamus has gone under the water, and you can just see the ripples. Here he comes, head popping out. Now you see, it's always worth coming to see what's happening at any one of the water holes, because you get to see sights like this. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Wondering around the same areas? <laughs> yes. Any tracks coming across? South. South again. She's gone back into the gully. Okay. Uh, just so you know, everybody, we have been joined by the bushwalk team, just in case you were wondering at the strange sounds that were emanating from the back of my vehicle. Brent tried very hard to sneak up and give us a fright and almost succeeded. Almost. Almost, but then you scuffed. Yes. I <laughs> and I knew that you knew we were here. 
<laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Enjoy. All right, back onto the hippopotamus that has just popped up and now gone back down again. Oh, goodness, sorry, there's a fly in my ear. There's very definitely a fly in my ear. So a hippopotamus can hold its breath for up to five, six minutes, even a little bit longer. I've timed a hippopotamus before and it's been under the water for nearly 10. So the larger they are, the longer they can actually hold their breath. And what they do is they just they go and they sit down at the bottom on the floor of the dam. <sighs> snorting away and a, a waterhole like this is where a hippopotamus feels safe so they can be one of the most dangerous creatures to encounter on foot but because they're in the water what that means is that you actually can walk across the dam wall or walk around the edge of the water without disturbing them too much and that's actually what the bushwalk team is doing at the moment they're walking along the dam wall there they are walking across and the hippo giving just a little bit of a snort and splashing in the water just to let them know not to come too close you can see he's keeping a close eye but not too worried about coming out of the water now Derek you want to know if hippo have more than four teeth well, Derek has obviously learned a little bit about hippopotamus because very well done, Derek. The four main teeth that you immediately see are the tusks in the mouth of the hippopotamus. And those are the two sharp ones that stick out forwards and then the two sharp ones that stick right upwards. But yes, they do have more than four teeth because they have to eat grass. They have to chew on grass. And usually what they do is they actually crop the grass with their top lip and then chew it a little bit before swallowing. So very well done Derek. I'm very impressed that you knew that a hippo had those four sharp tusks and what I'm doing now is I'm just trying to find a picture of a hippo's skull. Okay I was going to show you a, a picture of a hippopotamus skull however Byron has found something interesting and I think we better head across to him quickly before it disappears. I have indeed, Jamie. Now you at a water hole and you probably have a few of these around too. But look at this. It is a terrapin. Now some of you might be saying, oh, it's a turtle. So a terrapin is a freshwater turtle that lives in fresh water. And we have lots of terrapins out in this area. And every now and then we're lucky and we get to see them out of the water basking in the, basking in the sun possibly just warming up a little bit enjoying the afternoon sunlight but isn't that a strange looking creature the terrapin so it's not a tortoise slightly different it can't pull its head into it or into its shell like a tortoise does but it can move its head to the side to try and protect its head a little bit but uh, the shell is also not as hard as that of a tortoise and these, as I said, live in the water, whereas the tortoises live on land. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting little creature. But now, there's something else interesting I'd like to show you. That Senzo actually spotted. Now have a look at this. This is amazing. Just in this bush next to us. Look at that. A little scrub hair. Isn't that wonderful? A beautiful little scrub hair. Now usually these little creatures come out at night so we're very lucky to see it during the day. Now does anyone know what the name for an animal that comes out at night, what is that called? So quickly see if you know and tell your teachers and see if they'll, and they'll send the answer to me. So an animal that only comes out at night so animals like bats these little scrub hares um, so think about that see if you know the answer send it to me and then I'll tell you if you're right I'm gonna stay with this little scrub hare for a little bit think of some more questions for me let's head back to Jamie and see what she's doing at the waterhole 
Well, from something very small and fluffy to something not quite so small and definitely not nearly as fluffy, we are still with our hippopotamus. And Derek, you asked the question about a hippopotamus's teeth. Can I show you a picture? Because this is going to, you might even find this particular picture actually a little bit scary. Now, this is what a hippopotamus skull looks like. How scary is that? So those are the four teeth that I was telling you about, those sharp, sharp, sharp canines and incisors. Those are the four ones that are basically the weapons of a hippopotamus. But it's also got very sharp tusks up here and, of course, a whole range of molars at the back that it uses to chew the grass that it eats. And when you see teeth like that, you could almost be forgiven for thinking that perhaps a hippopotamus might be a carnivore. But it's not. It only eats grass and it uses those sharp, sharp pointy teeth for fighting with other hippopotamus and for defending themselves. And a very good question from Daryl. So if a hippopotamus eats only grass and yet it is such a large animal, how much does a hippopotamus eat in a day? And you're probably looking at at least 50 kilograms for a smallish hippopotamus, so over 100 pounds of grass in one night. So a hippopotamus, basically, they can't be out during the day, especially on a hot day like today, because their skin is very sensitive to the sun, and that's why he's hiding in that water hole. But at night, that's when a hippopotamus comes out and starts to eat grass. When it's nice and cool and the sun isn't going to give them any sunburn. So they eat lots of food and it's the same as those elephants that you saw with Byron as well. An elephant can easily eat over 300 pounds of food in one day. How incredible is that? Now that's actually one of the things that these hippo really struggled with during, dr during the drought. Now Ashley, you want to know, and I'm sorry actually, I must just probably correct, I said 50 kilograms, I think it's probably more like 40 kilograms that an, a hippo will eat at night. That's about over 80 pounds of food. Sorry, Ashley, you wanted to know why is his ears twitching? And that's also a very good question and very observant of you. The reason his ears are twitching is because while he's sitting in the water, there are biting flies that are landing on his ears and f sort of biting the sensitive skin around the tips of his ears. So that's one of the reasons why he's flicking his ears. The other reason that he does it every time he comes to the surface is because he's got water around his ears and he doesn't want the water to go all the way into the sensitive ear canal. So he gives his ears a good shake. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry, that took me by surprise and that was a very silly sneeze. <laughs> And another good question from Audriana, who'd like to know, why are their ears so small? Well, it's because they'd actually, if they were really large, they'd get in the way. And as I said, you, they don't want to get water in their ears. So by having tiny ears, they can actually go underneath the water without the water draining down into their eardrum and giving them an ear infection. But they also don't need big ears. They don't really need to be able to hear underneath the surface of the water. And they, but they do need to be able to smell. They still need to be able to hear, of course. <coughs> Just not as well as some of the other animals, like, for example, an antelope. So if you compare the animal with one of the biggest ears, which is an anyala, which is a type of antelope, and I'm sure we could maybe even find one to show you. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Swallowed a fly. If you look at something like a nyala, an nyala uses its huge ears to amplify the sounds around it because it's an animal that likes to hide away and has got things like lions and leopards that might sneak up on it. Whereas a lion doesn't really try to sneak up on a hippopotamus. If a lion does kill a hippopotamus, it's because the hippo is out of water and not particularly well, not particularly healthy. And that's when you've got lots and lots of lions. So it's very rare for a hippopotamus to be hunted by big cats. So they don't need to listen to the bush around them all the time. But look at the way that a hippo's skull is built. Look at the nostrils on the top and the eyes on the top and the ears on the top. A very clever design, which means that while he's sitting in the water, he can look at us and listen to us and smell us. 
Now, there's lots of different creatures that enjoy the water, and it sounds as though Byron might have found another one. So we're still sitting here close to the water and that little scrub here has just disappeared into the bush probably to go and rest before it comes out tonight. Now David, you got it 100% right by saying that that scrub hair is nocturnal. You are right, that is what, it, what it's known as with, for animals that come out at night and move around at night. It's called nocturnal. And that's exactly what that scrub hair is. So it's moved into the bush, but that terrapin is still just on the edge of the water and it's always interesting to see them. Now Ashley, you asked how these scrub hares defend themselves against any predators. So Ashley, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you actually. That's what, I think that's a good idea. Let me show you. Hold on a second. I'm going to jump out and you can watch me. So have a look here, Ashley. So the scrub is, they're very, very small, and but they are agile. They're fast little runners. They've got to be careful of predators like owls, maybe even leopard or lions um, too, moving around at night. They've got to be very careful. So what the scrub is do is they'll lie in a thicket, they'll lie down, and they lie very, very still, and they won't move. But as soon as the predator gets close, they'll pick up on the movement, and then they jump up and they run. So they'll run away, but what they do is if a predator gets close they'll dodge one direction or the other very very quickly so the predator runs past them so they're very very agile they can move and change directions very very easily so that is one of their best defense mechanisms against the predator you see I'm almost as fast as a scrub bear <laughs> all right I think let's move on from here Oh, Jose, Jose, I don't know how fast the terrapin is underwater. I'm not sure. I've, I've never seen them actually swimming, but I would imagine they're probably very fast. And also, I've seen them move on land, and believe it or not, they can move fairly quickly on land, but I'm sure they are much faster in the water, but I don't know exactly how fast. I'm sure they're very good swimmers. Uh, now, now, Lisa, the terrapins don't get that big. The biggest I've seen is called a serrated hingeback terrapin. That's in this area, I mean. And they get to about that big. So not, not very big. About that big, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's about the biggest I've seen. Um, so they don't get very big. Not like the tortoises. Some of the tortoises can get about this tall. Very, very big. Very large. The leopard leopard tortoise they've got beautiful patterns on their shell and they get very very big i've seen very big ones but uh, the terrapins don't get that big now just quickly yasmin you asked a question about when we thought we wanted to go into guiding and working in the bush so just to answer your question quickly i think i only i've always loved the bush and been and always been very interested but i only got interested in it uh, from about or wanted to work in the bush at about 22 23 years old that's when i really thought i want to work in the bush forever so yeah but i've always loved the bush and always been going first time i went to the bush on safari i was five years old anyway i just want to say a big goodbye to our schools thank you very very much for joining us thank you for the wonderful questions and we look forward to having you on safari live again so goodbye everybody and have a wonderful wonderful day <music>once again a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the I don't want to say the adult portion of the sunset safari just to the part where the schools have left us to go about their usual school day and we send through your questions so for those of you that perhaps have just jumped on board my name is Jamie and this afternoon Martin is on camera with me Martin is doing a job interview so I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming him wishing him the best of luck and of course encouraging him because this is a very new and very foreign thing to have to do you can please do send through your questions now that we've finished chatting to the school kids send through your questions and you can do that using the hashtag safari live on twitter uh, let's see whether or not we can have some interesting conversations this afternoon 
Unfortunately, my plan for this afternoon so far has proved to be, well, as often plans are, completely up in the air. Because Shungile, it seems, according to Brent, has crossed south over our southern boundary. So she's disappeared and all of the water holes have been devoid of animal life despite my best efforts. But I'm not giving up. I'm going to continue on this hot, hot day to check up and see whether or not there are any animals wallowing or coming to have a drink. I've spotted some very large grey things that have been around me all afternoon. I wonder... They're going to continue to elude, elude me. They're all the way across the Mulwati drainage line. And I can't really get you a good view just yet. Okay, well hopefully, Rebecca, is it okay if I go through this dip? Ah, never mind, I don't have to get too much. I can go through the dip, but I'll send you over to Byron while I do. So like if they've... <clears throat> Alright, so I'm heading towards the clearings now on Cheetah Plains and see if we can't find anything there. Wouldn't it be nice to find a a cheetah, cheetah or two? It's still quite warm this afternoon, so I think if there are any predators around, they may, they're pro probably just resting in the shade until it gets a bit cooler. But it's a lovely day, a very, very nice day. Blue, blue skies. Might be able to see as I drive through here. You can just see those blue skies above me. Excuse me a second, somebody's just calling me. Afternoon, go ahead. Okay, copy. Thank you very much. I'm just getting an update. Somebody saw a herd of elephant. But uh, but I think we're going to stick to our plan and head towards the clearings and check those planes carefully. See what we can find. Who knows, we might just bump into something along the way. And I hope all of you are having a really, really great start to the week. It's Monday after all. <laughs> ah, speaking of elephants, Jamie's just managed to find some. Let's head back to her. Isn't that wonderful? We have indeed managed to find some in the form of this massive bull, who's not massive, large appearing off as soon as I mentioned that we had them and this beautiful lady hello big girl here we go they're all coming out now into the open and I think they've all been at that secret pan between Mumba Road and Ledwood Road that I only discovered relatively recently because Karula led me there it's a beautiful spot and it's completely hidden away it's right in the middle away from the roads and I think that's where they've been on their way to. Oh, here we go. They're all coming out now. Hello, guys. Here come the little calves trailing behind. Looks like two young males. And push each other around a little bit. It really has truly been an elephant-themed Monday. They've just been absolutely everywhere. This is a completely different herd to the one that Brent walked. It's a different herd to the one that Byron was with. They just seem to be down every single road that we drive along, which I'm not going to complain about because I love to sit with elephants. And I think that perhaps with a little bit of patience, if we sit with this herd, we can enjoy some quality time with them. There's a very, very large female moving up behind bringing up the rear of the herd making sure all is well it's been such a treat to see this many elephants but we do seem to go in swings and roundabouts out here 
There'll be weeks when we don't see an elephant, or if we do, if we see the bottom of an elephant disappearing. And then all of a sudden, we've got elephant herds everywhere. Oh, synchronized pooping. Mom and baby. That's a very good question coming through from Penny Pine. And as always, welcome to Penny Pine, who I had the opportunity to meet in Los Angeles many, many weeks ago. And Penny, it's, well, Helen actually, it's uh, Heather, it's lovely to see you or hear from you. You want to know if elephant dung could be used as fertilizer? That's also a very good question. I would assume so. I would say that it could it would work very well as a fertilizer for a, a garden. I don't see why it wouldn't. It certainly does the bush a tremendous amount of good and we know that it provides the perfect germinating point for the marula seeds that the elephants defecate out. I don't see why it wouldn't work well for fertilizer. It would certainly smell very nice. A great deal better than perhaps a store-bought compost or fertilizer. Would you mind if I came up here, boy? Big girl. Thank you. There we go. No, absolutely. I don't see why it shouldn't be. I don't see why it wouldn't work well as a fertilizer or a compost pile. And of course, elephant dung, supposedly with some impressive medicinal properties as well. Supposedly, if you burn it and sniff the smoke, it will get rid of a headache and the symptoms of a cold. Personally, I find that, having tried it, it just gives me a headache, an even bigger headache. It doesn't seem to work for me breathing in elephant dung smoke. It's also supposed to act as a fly repellent. And I don't know if any of you remember when I first started working here, and Steph and I were driving every day. Everybody else went on leave. <laughs> Steph and I were driving and Steph made himself that coffee tin anti-fly device dangled from the vehicle that he burnt smoke in. Our Ellie's just don't want to be on camera today. I'm going to keep searching. In the meantime, Byron's had more luck with something grey. I have indeed. Um, we've been very fortunate this afternoon so far. And look at that beautiful warthog. It's been wallowing and digging in the mud with a red-billed oxpecker on the back, picking off the little ticks. Uh, it's actually a nice family that we've seen around there. I wonder if we can see some of the others close by in that grass. If we just pan to the left, you might see them moving through there. Uh, but you see it's actually very thick at the moment. They've just moved off. Um, now there were seven warthog here all together, two adults and five little piglets. And that adult female is still there. I can hear a great go away bird calling. Now I wonder why. Is there an eagle perhaps around that it's alarm calling at? Uh, there is indeed. What is that? Looks like an African hawk eagle. Hang on a second. Let's see if we can get it. You see over there, Senzo, there it flies. There we go. It's a bit tricky to tell with it flying away from us now. Oh dear, I've lost it completely. So that looked like an African hawk eagle flying away from us. Um, a bit difficult for me to see, to be honest, but those great go-away birds were alarm calling at it. And the warthog moved off also. Nice to see a big family group like that with seven warthogs. There's five little piglets. Uh, that was interesting to see. Unfortunately, they've just moved off through the long grass and we can't see them anymore. The grass is so long. <laughs> They're hiding very, very well. I want to see if that bird comes back this way. Oh. It's a bit too far for us, unfortunately. I don't think you'd be able to see it. Oh, don't worry, it's flown if you're even further away from us. All right, well, why don't we continue further south to those clearings? We're almost there. Might find something else along the way. So... It's just a nice, nice um, 
little scenario there with that uh, grey go-away bird alarm calling. I could hear they weren't happy, giving that uh, little call that they give. I don't know if that's very accurate. But um, they, they were alarm calling at that eagle that was flying, <laughs> flying away. Um, I'm not going to do it again, Rebecca, because I don't think it was very accurate. <laughs> Let's see what we can find in the trees, on the ground, in the shade. We're looking everywhere. Uh, let's head back to Jamie and see what she's up to and get an update from her. Oh, not too much different. Unfortunately, it seems as though our elephants don't want to be on camera no matter how much patience I was going to try and show it doesn't help when they move in the opposite direction certainly doesn't help so where to now Bovelzog Dam I think I haven't been there yet since I've come back from my three-week leave so I'm keen on having a look to see whether or not there's still water I'm really sorry I didn't quite catch that name let me just ask Rebecca to repeat it I think it sounded like Geeky Bess. Geeky Bess? Am I right? Oh, Beth. Geeky Beth. Right, so it's completely different to Juicy Bess, which is what I heard the first time around. Geeky Beth, my sincere apologies for mangling your username. My, I, it happens, I'm afraid. Now, you want to know how big the territories are that a typical elephant herd will hold? They actually don't have territories. They're not a territorial animal. They have home ranges, but essentially their home ranges are so large as to be almost nomadic in a way. And they'll move to where there's resources. And of course, you get those stories of ancient memories. And that's where the idea of elephants having such good memories has come from, because they seem to know in times of need where to go to find long forgotten sources of water that they might not have seen for many, many, many years. So they're almost nomadic, essentially. We do see some of the same elephants on these live safari drives. We've got very identifiable ones that move through these areas, one of which immediately jumps, pops into my mind is Fang. And then there's this stumpy trunked female and her beautiful family. And then also, interestingly enough, we see some of the same bulls as well. I was looking at the footage and the screenshots of that elephant that both Byron and Brent saw. And Jerry and I were discussing it. We remember him. It was on the Sunrise Safari. We remember him from last year. He's got a very... I, I don't know what is wrong with his hip. I don't know. It seems odd that an elephant would be able to manage with a dislocated hip. But I want to say he's got a dislocated hip. He's got completely wonky hips. And he limps and he drags his foot. So we do see the same individuals. He's also got a very easily identifiable, very tatty ear. So we get to know certain individuals, but most of the time the elephants that we see we're not we don't necessarily immediately recognize. And they're not territorial at all, which is why when you see elephant herds come together, there's actually often quite an elaborate greeting ceremony. They're all happy to see each other. It's not like two lion prides encountering each other where you'll have growls and snarls and occasionally fights. If two elephant herds meet each other, you'll often see the adult females walk up, touch the tips of their, they wrap their trunks around the top of the other individual's head, and they touch the tip to the temporal gland, and sniff, and then take their trunk off and put it in their own mouths, just to kind of reacquaint themselves with that particular individual. And you'll see the little males of the group, the young elephants, running to greet each other from different herds, like long-lost friends, as if they go, yay, some company, somebody to play with. Oh, goodness gracious, it seems as though Brent and I have both had very similar ideas this afternoon. First Shongile, and now I imagine Brent started making his way towards Buffelsog Dam. Let's find out from him. Well, we've actually managed to get to Buffelzook Dam. So with the leopard drought we've been having, we're definitely focusing on leopards on bushwalk so we can track 
So Shongile's tracks crossed to the south. Now early this morning Gajima was seen just to the north of the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. So we've come here, we're now checking very carefully around the edge. And uh, if we find no tracks here, we're going to go up to the second little uh, river system that flows into the dam. I think he's likely to be there. Now, even though he's a very skittish leopard, we might not get the best view of him on bushwalk. Oh, we got a spider web. There we go. Uh, the, the, he might have a carcass or a kill in the area and which means we can get a vehicle in there and really start to start really relaxing him uh, and especially as it gets darker uh, leopards tend to be far more relaxed or unrelaxed leopards tend to be far more relaxed in the dark it is their happy place oh we do have some nice butterflies there on the moist soil here so we've got some African vagrants having a, a little drink of wet sand. And we go two African vagrants and just to the left of them is a common joker with an orange. There we go. Just see them opening there we go. Opening and closing its wings. And it is it really still here. There's only one Cape turtle dove calling, a couple of insects making a noise. Oh, hopefully that bodes, bodes well for our leopard search. So another good reason we come check around these areas is because the ground's quite soft and somewhere the leopards would have had to cross. So hopefully we get to see their pug marks. Also it might have meandered down to a little corner like this for a drink. Leopards don't particularly like drinking uh, where that in areas that go straight onto deep water. They prefer shallow water. They do have crocodile paranoia and that's a wise thing to have out in the bush. Hello Debbie. Debbie's wondering, have the royal family now split up? Oh, Debbie, it's impossible. It's impossible to be 100% sure on that. Now, at this age, it is likely that Chungile might remain uh, independent from her mother, but they still might join up again. I'm pretty sure Hasana will definitely try join up again, even if mom doesn't want it. So it's, it's, it's going to be difficult to see. Um, but only time will, will I'll be able to answer us that definitely. Now the other thing that's quite exciting about being in this area is that really big elephant bull that Byron and I both saw this morning. He was sort of meandering towards Buffalo's Hook the last time I saw him this morning. So who knows, maybe he might put an appearance as well. We're just checking all the little open bits of ground very carefully for tracks. Ooh, Byron's got one of my favorite birds in the bush. Let's go have a look. Ah, uh, Brent, well, I'm glad I also like these ground hornbills, the beautiful ground hornbills, four of them. Always nice to see a, and our group of ground hornbill is known as a phalanx, phalanx of ground hornbill. It's because of that walking strategy that they've got. They walk through the long grass looking for food, Let's see if we can keep up with them a little bit. There they go. Always great to see the ground hornbills. Let me see. I'm going to move forward. Oh, wait. There's a lovely view of that one. See, they look quite warm. See how they're walking with their beaks open? It's usually to try and cool themselves down. Let's see. Now, the ground hornbills tend to be a little shy, so... Oh, there they go, they're taking off. Let's see if the others fly. Watch them, they might land in the tree. There they go, those beautiful white tipped wings. Ah, well done, Senzo, look at that. And they just dis disappeared into the tree. Or into the trees. They're flying off to the back. Ah, yeah, it's difficult to view them from here now. I'm not going to push them anymore. I don't want to cause them to move off or anything like that. At least we've got a lovely little view of them. Fascinating birds, the ground hornbills. Really, really very interesting. I'm so glad we got to see them. Four of them. That was awesome. 
I'll move around this area so we don't disturb them anymore. See, they are quite nervous, or a little skittish, I'd say. I just don't like the vehicles following them too much, but sometimes you get close to them, so it all depends. I've had a look in these clearings and unfortunately no luck just yet. Uh, no cheetah or anything like that. Uh, there's actually very little activity around here at the moment. No antelope. Maybe it's also because it is very, very hot. So if there is anything around here, it's lying in the shade. And in this long grass, if there are cheetah lying down, we definitely are not going to see them. I'm heading towards the Kruger Park boundary. Going to have a look to see what we can find around there. Maybe we're lucky. So, JC, the ground hornbills are endangered and threatened for a number of reasons, but the main reason actually is, is that they do not have a very successful breeding strategy. So with the ground hornbills, they usually lay two eggs, but what happens is one egg, or well, the egg that hatches first, usually either kills the other chick or pushes the, the, the egg, the other egg out of the, out of the nest so that the adults only raise the one chick. And then it takes about um, between five and seven years for that chick to reach adult maturity. So it takes a long time. So all that effort to raise one chick is not very, very efficient. So that's one of the main reasons why the ground hornbills are not that successful. A lot of breeding programs have been set up to try and protect the ground hornbills. People will go find nests and then as soon as the eggs are laid, they will go and take one of the eggs out and try incubate it and raise that chick to reintroduce it into the wild. Nice peaceful afternoon, very, very peaceful. It's wonderful. I always think for some reason, whenever I come into this area, I always think I'm going to find something rare. I think I think pangolin, I think a civet or a serval or something like that. I don't know why, but whenever I drive through this area, that's what I think about. Anyway, while I continue my search, let's head to Brent, see how he's doing on his walk. Well, we're right in this myriad of little river systems that Kojima is famous for disappearing into and as you can see as we go down into them it's near impossible to follow him in a car so we really got to hope he's got a kill here somewhere we look here it's really steep narrow little drainage lines I've lost him in this area many times now we're just hoping to find a nice fresh track or even better a drag mark just some long tailed sh shrikes monotonous larks calling it's quite still here there's not even a breath of wind at the moment quite hot as well. Let's try to get down here. Yeah. Let's get 
already process. You can see, not the easiest part of the world. So we're just hoping that there's a footprint between the rocks in here. So far, no luck. Of course, I'm going very quietly, very slowly while we're in this area. Now we could even only just hear him run away from us. Now just up ahead here is where one of the Inkahumas gave birth to their cubs. even more narrow. Hi Beverly, a big welcome to Safari Live. Now Beverly would like to know, are leopard families happy to see each other after they've been split for some time? Well Beverly that all depends. If it's a mother who's been split from her young cubs, they are ecstatic to see each other. But as they get older, those interactions become less and less, and mom becomes less and less pleased to see them. Oh, hello. Hello, Acreas. Oh, and they're so relaxed. We've got some tiny little butterflies, my favorite butterfly species. There we go. A little Acrea. Or my favorite butterfly family. My favorite out of all of them is a butterfly called the Wandering Donkey. Oh, I bumped the bush. Whoopsie. Land again. There we go. So, they are feeding off a Venonia, is the flower. Now, I still am really confused to why it's called a silver Venonia when it's got purple flowers, but that's what it's called. I remember correctly the Latin name is Venonia fastidigiatum and it likes sort of quite rocky soils you can have a look this isn't great soil for grasses to grow here so lots of quartz lots of granite rock so you've got some very sparse grasses and some of these wild flowers that like disturbed areas Mary. Mary's wondering, am I afraid of venomous snakes in the long grass? Uh, no, not really, Mary. Uh, what generally happens is the vibrations from my feet will, will chase them away. The only snake that I might stand on is a puff adder, but they've got a very big hiss that'll let me know that they're there. Now look at this. This is, we haven't seen too many really big orb spiders this year, and this is a massive female. I mean, Absolutely massive. I just don't want to damage her web, so I just got to find a way. Okay, I'm going to go underneath to the other side of her. Oh, she got a fright anyway, and I didn't even touch. But I mean, look at the size of my hand compared to her. She is incredibly big. Wow. Beautiful. Now, on these spider, big orb spider webs, I'm looking, ah, you still, are you on her, Craig? Yeah. Now she's massive, probably an, 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 a 15th, an 18th of her size is a male orb spider. And here we go, there's a male over there. And my favorite s spider species is also on this web. And in this light, they should be becoming really, really stunning. Can you see the little dewdrop spiders? Now, that's what you, and they are called kleptoparasites. 
So they don't even make the big web, they don't catch the big prey, but all the tiny bits of food that the orb is unable to eat, uh, they will eat. Now of course the male orb, he's got a tough time. Now firstly he's got to woo a creature of the size of that female, and secondly, whoopsie, I nearly fell over, he, he's got to not get eaten while doing it. So many an orb male orb spider has ended up as dinner or lunch. So he's actually got to sneak up behind her and tickle her belly ever so gently to get her in the right frame of mood not to be eaten. But we haven't seen that many big, big orb spiders this year and she is massive. I'm just going to sneak back underneath. Oh, hello David Ryan. David Ryan says she is, she is beautiful, indeed she is. And um, a lot of people get quite scared of really big spiders like this, but she can bite, but I've, I've handled many hundreds of orbs and I've never been bitten. Uh, they'd rather sneak off to the edge and get away. Now, an, a spider of her size is going to be able to eat uh, up to small birds like waxbills and fire finches, and I actually have seen that happen before. Now, I'm just noticing this dewdrop spider. Oh, there's one that's in the light. That's what I'm looking for. Look, look at him there. You see the one in the light there? Uh, C. Evans is wondering if they're also known as silver droplet spiders. Um, I've heard them called mercury spiders, but it, it sounds about right. That uh, I do like the name dewdrop because when I mean, you see these webs uh, in the early morning and they've got all those dew on there, that's, and they look they look absolutely stunning. But it's a, I always find a a big orb spider's web fascinating because it's it's a whole ecosystem within itself. Now you see all the leftover carapaces. Uh, of the different victims of the spider web. Now, she's finished eating all she can eat out of them, and there's a very important reason she leaves them right in the center of her web. It's, it's a deterrent for birds and that might be flying, so they don't fly through and break her web. So it's just a, a small way to stop certain things walking through a web. Of course, this is probably not the best spot to put a web because it's right on an elephant path, although she seems she's been quite lucky and no eddies have walked down here for quite some time. And see, it's getting a little bit later in the evening. The Franklin are starting to cackle, and hopefully that leopard's going to start moving. Now, as I said, this is probably my favorite male leopard, uh, mostly because he isn't relaxed. And it's really special in an area like this where you get to see animals that haven't seen that many people. And I also just love the habituation process, the challenge of, of taking on and, and, and getting that animal relaxed around the vehicles. Okay, well, we're going to keep meandering through this little sort of myriad of, of, of river systems here. Hopefully we get some luck uh, while we do that. Let's see how Byron's search for rare creatures on Cheetah Plains is going. <laughs> yeah, Brent, unfortunately the search for rare creatures is not going very well at the moment. The bush is so thick, I'm not seeing too much at the moment. Uh, oh. uh. You know what, I just saw some little dwarf mongoose running in front of us. Uh, I think they've all disappeared into the grass, unfortunately. Just in here, yeah, and I guarantee there's no chance of us seeing them. Just little flashes of brown mongoose running in front of us. Sure, the sun is bright at the moment. I'm just hang on a second. We've got a little spider web on our lens. Have we got a cloth there, Sinza? Uh, hold on a second. Let me just try to get rid of this. I think it's gone. <laughs> All gone. Is there something in my teeth, Rebecca? <laughs>
it is really, really very thick in parts of Cheetah Plains at the moment. Can't believe it. It's wonderful to see though, and it's you know it just uh, it shows you the different times of year. I'm sure some of you, or well, most of you, watched in uh, September, October last year. Can't believe the difference. I mean, if you have to look back to see what the bush looked like back then during the drought and what it looks like now, it really is amazing. And you know, we were saying that the whole time during the drought, during those, that dry season, the bush will change, the rains will come and things will grow again. But the drought, I don't know if I would go as far as saying it's important, but it is nature's way of keeping a natural balance. Getting, uh, you know, it, it kind of um, differentiates the, the the strong from the weak and uh, and gets rid of the the um, the animals that aren't strong enough to survive during the drought. So that only the, the strongest genes do continue. Now oh, this is interesting. Have a look at this. Just off to the side. I'm going to get out here for a second. Let's just have a look here with me. I'm trying to see if I can see what it was, but look at the grass. It's very flat here. Do you see that? Now this looks like it's from an elephant perhaps. It's been either walking through here um, or may even have laid down, but I think what's possibly happened is I'm just trying to check the branches to see if it's been feeding on this tree. Uh, but it looks like an elephant or a few elephant have stood in this area. They flattened the grass and possibly even laid down in this area. But look, just this little section that I'm standing in. Very flat. Very, very, very flat. That's amazing. So that was done by elephant. And you know, we do know they do lie down and... We saw it the other morning, but um, but what this might have been from is possibly a bull, because it's up against a termite mound. Now the big bull elephant, um, when they do lie down, and they do lie down indeed, they do rest, they may do it against a termite mound. The reason for that is then it's a bit easier for them to get up and move again once they once they continue. So I do think that this may be a bull elephant that lay down here against the side of the termite mound. It's very interesting. That's one thing the grass and the long grass does help with is perhaps following animals. And some of the predators, it's a bit difficult unless you catch them early in the morning. You see their tracks heading off road and moving through an area. You'll probably see the dew disturbed on the grass. And because there's a lot of moisture on the grass, it might be a bit easier to follow the path that these cats have taken. But animals like um, elephant, buffalo, rhino, you'll see the tracks heading through the bush very very easily in the long grass at the moment because they flatten the, the grass while they walk ah oh this is interesting and I think it's about time Brent it sounds like he's washing his feet <laughs> Not quite washing my feet, but I'm removing the spiky grass seeds from my sandals. Now, I think we've actually disturbed that leopard. So, as we came up towards this spot here, and you can see there's water flowing right next to me here. Uh, there's an actual natural seep. It's one of, one of my favorite seeps in the whole of, whole of, whole of Juma when it's, when it's operational. I think he's been lying just below here. So, we heard some cesticulars, um, some wax bills. Alarm calling, but the grass is just too high. So we try to take a big walk around to have a look down, and we can't see in there. So that really steep little section of drainage lines where we were earlier, I'm right at the headwaters of it now, having some water. As you can see here, let's have a quick look. You can see it's actually flowing here. So it's seeping out of the ground. 
And this is actually relatively clean water. Definitely cleaner than water than some of the water we've seen Steph drink over the last while. But and you can see it's still just seeping slowly through and then flowing down. Now this will be a really important spot to come a little bit later in the year as the dry season sets in. And you can see the elephants are already utilizing it. And there's lots of dung and when you can see all their footprints where they've been digging it deeper. And they like to sort of splash in the mud. But unfortunately for us, no elephants here. Now there's about four or five little pools that flow down here and I think that leopard was lying up not too far from here. And we, we're just going to wait a little bit in this area uh, and then as it gets a little bit cooler we're going to head back towards where we left the vehicle which is probably about two kilometers that way and I think he's moving down these little river systems towards the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Now we haven't seen any Impala, we haven't seen any Nyala, uh, only the odd Diker while we've been tramping through here. So hopefully he decides to pop out in the open. Otherwise I think it might be worthwhile coming to have a look very early tomorrow morning. And I was hoping he might have a carcass or a kill in these little river systems here. It doesn't look like it. So it means he's probably just going to keep avoiding us on foot. Okay. Uh, Dustin says you're very brave walking in sandals. Now I think people who walk in boots are very brave. You just get very hot and sweaty feet. And so you can see here's a little reservoir above. Uh, and you can see the, how the grasses grow in these natural seeps. And then where a little bit of water comes out to the top, the elephants dig it out and make it deeper. And eventually this will be a much bigger river system throughout its entirety. Because every now and then they just extend that catchment a little bit. And you can hear all the monotonous larks again. 